All right, guys, let's get started. Um, today's topic, epidemics, epidemics on networks. So we previously talked about a lot about network structure. Um, today we're gonna to talk about processes, in particular, the spread of epidemics. Now, before we jump into, jump into epidemics on networks, we'll talk about, in general, epidemics models. And those models goes back to like 1920s, 1930s. Um, but they're the basis for epidemic type of models on networks. And so we're gonna start with those, uh, they're called comportamental epidemic models, have nothing to do with networks. So we'll first do that, and then uh, we'll switch to and go and talk about uh, what's called probabilistic network models. And then we'll talk a little bit about simulations, so how to simulate those things. All right, so that's, that's the plan for right now. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start with this, what's called mathematical epidemiology, all right? And it goes back to the, to the fundamental paper by Kermak and McKendrick, 1927, right? Pretty much like 100 years ago. Um, but it's pretty much, they, they, they started this whole field of mathematical epidemiology with this paper. And uh, we're gonna just, you know, learn um, very simple models that were proposed in that paper. And then we'll see how we can actually extend them to uh, networks. And so the, the, the model they proposed were called uh, deterministic compartmental models. So the idea is the following. So you have a population, right? Um, and uh, you might get a few individuals in that population who are infected you know, with some disease. You know, I don't know, think about flu or whatever. So then the population is literally has two parts, right? Those that are infected and, that, and those that are susceptible to infection, right? They're not infected. So then people who are infected interact with people who are susceptible to infection. And there is some probability, there is some chance that on every interaction, the infection spreads for those who are infected to those who are susceptible. And, um, you know, that happens by chance. You know, somebody sneezes on you, right? You got it. Um, and as time follows, the fraction, the part of that, the fraction of the people who are infected increases, right, due to new infected people. And the fraction that are susceptible to infection decreases. And so then there are a couple of things that might be happening. Then you can consider different processes. So one process could be that um, those people who are infected, right, they're sick, like with flu, they actually recover and they move to the part, you know, to the people who are, again, susceptible. And if you know, if you, you know, get a flu, you can recover, but you can get a flu in a couple of weeks again, easily. So that, that, that you know, the, your immune system will not learn to defend you against this, the flu after you actually had a flu. Or there could be a different situation if it's not the flu, but you know, some, some, something, you know, um, either, either infection that actually you will have a resistance after you, you were sick or you know, if the person dies um, after the infection, um, you know, like bubonic plaque, um, then you know, those people just are removed from consideration completely, right? So the population decreases in a sense. And so again, the idea of the model that you have those groups of people, right? The infection sort of goes from one group to another. People, because of this migrate, uh, you know, move from group of susceptible to infected or from infected to susceptible. Um, and the, the major assumption is that it's what's called complete mixing or fully mixing, which means each person interacts with each other person within those models. Now, it's clear that this is, you know, false assumption, right? In the real life, it's not happening that way. But, you know, again, back in the days, that was the first model. And uh, actually, it's surprisingly, it worked surprisingly well. And so, that the assumption. Now, um, as I mentioned, within this model, there's really three 
classes, right? It's three compartments of people, people we consider. It's those susceptible, those are infected, and those that are recovered. And depending on the model, we can either look on um, you know, two of those, like susceptible infected, or all three type of classes. And we also don't take into account any other sort of social issues like you know, birth or death or migration due to like other reasons except for this. Right? So it's again, it's a very, very simplified model. So, a little bit of math and a little bit of differential equations. And they actually, good here, they, they allow you to describe the model. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the people from susceptible group can get infection and get infected, right? If you have some, if you infected people, they can infect, you know, the entire classroom. But the total sum of the people, of course, who are susceptible and who are infected doesn't change, right? It's the, the entire population. And what we can try to do is we can write an equation, the sort of the, the, the equation that tells us how the infection, how the number of infected people evolves with time. And so if we think that at some moment of time there is i as function of t number of infected people, then after time delta t, after a little bit of time, we can actually see how many it's going to be. So it is the, the people who were infected at the previous moment of time plus the number of people who got infected during this time period delta t. And here, uh, what, you, what you see here is, is the product of s and i. Why? Well, because the number of people who get in, each person is from infected group can contact each person from uninfected group. If there is s people in uninfected group and i people in infected group, well, that's total number of pairs that can form. And if beta is a coefficient that tells you the probability of transmission of infection during the contact, that's how many people will get infected on average uh, during the time delta t. And that's pretty much it, right? So you have number of people that were infected at time delta, at time t. This is how much more can get infected during this next delta t. And that's how many we're going to have after that time, right? So let's say this is how many people were infected in the morning. This is how many people can get infected during the day. Um, and it's proportional to, of course, the number of infected people and number of possible people to get infected. And that's, you know, how many infected you'll have by night. Okay? And so this thing just growing, growing and growing with this, within this model, it's just people getting and getting infected. Very simple. Now, what you do is you take this minus this, right? You take, put this on the left-hand side, divide by delta t. That's the definition of derivative. And so di dt is then equal to this. And that's your very, very simple differential equation. Now, in fact, you don't even have to do differential equation. You can solve this um, the way it is written by just sort of consecutively going step, stepping through step, step, step. But it's easier to write it as differential equation. Um, and then um, what we're going to do is we're going to also change a little bit notation and go instead of just absolute value of people, we're going to look at the fraction of people, which is the ratio of absolute value to the total number of people. And so at the beginning, pretty much everybody is healthy, and so um, this is very large and this is small, but then, you know, it decreases. So if you do this normalization, um, the fraction of people who are, inf who are susceptible to infection plus the fraction of people who are infected has to be equal to 1, you know, because total 1. And, you know, this is the equation that we just wrote on the previous page. Now, we also need some initial conditions. In order for infection to spread, you need to have a few people who are sick at the beginning of, of the process, right? Otherwise, you know, there is no way for infection to get in. And so you have some initial conditions in time equals zero. There is that many people who are infected. And then this is a differential equation, right? How I got it? Well, I just took this equation and plugged it in, plug in this formula. So that's our differential equation. Now, the reason I ask you if you remember about differential equations is like, okay, when you see this, do you know how to solve it? Any ideas? Any recollection? Is 
You remember about like separation of variables? Sort of, kind of, okay. Yeah, you take this, you move it to the left, you take this, move it to the right, you get di over this on the right-hand side dt, and then you integrate left side and right-hand side. Okay. Now, um, well, this is a skill, right, to be able to solve differential equations. This class is not about solving differential equations, but, um, you know, there, there, there is an equation, and um, what I want you to, to remember that, you know, this equation has a mathematical solution, right? And the solution is this. That's a function that describes how the fraction of infected people changes with time. And, um, well, so first of all, if you just take this, right, this expression, plug it in into this equation, it will satisfy this equation, right? Otherwise, it's not a solution. And then you can also analyze and see what, what it actually says. For example, if time is equal to zero, right, if this is zero, then exponent to this to the power of zero is one. You get I zero plus one minus I zero, I zero cancels. So I zero divided by one is I zero. So it means, uh, you know, when, when time is equal to zero, the solution is the initial fraction. Now, when time goes to infinity, right, when, when, we'll, when we observe the system for a long time, what do you expect I as a function of T will be? Let's say, you know, we expect that everybody will get sick, right, because this infection spreads. And so if I is a fraction of infected people, what, sh what is it equal to then? To one. To one, right? It should be become one. Let's see if this actually, if the formula does it. If I take this t and send it to infinity, this exponent to the minus infinity, what is this? Exponent to the minus very large negative number. Zero, so this will become zero. You have i uh, as a function of t is equal i zero divided by i zero, which is one. Yeah? So at least this solution makes sense, right? It satisfies our conditions, and it shows you like, okay, well, that's sort of the shape how the infected people, as the time progresses, you know, how infection will, will take over the room, right? Okay. It's a very simple model. Now, let's think about slightly different model that's going to be what's called SIS model. And the previous model was SI because it's susceptible infected, and that's it. This is SIS, so it is susceptible to infected to susceptible, which means um, we get people who are you, you know, sick. I'm sorry, they're susceptible, then becoming sick, then they're recovering, and they can get sick again, right? So it's sort of, you can get like a circular process happening, right, over and over again. So again, the constraints the same way. Now, if I try to write the, the, the differential equation that describes this process, like dynamical process, um, it, it's going to have uh, you know, two parts. And this, this equation is equivalent to, uh, to this one, right? Look, this equation was saying the number that changes in infected people, it increases proportionally to the number of infected and number of susceptible people. And it just increases. This number is, is it beta is positive. What we have here is, this is the same DIDT, number of infected people. It increases due to the contact in between susceptible people and infected people. So this number of, this is a fraction of infected, fraction of susceptible, right? The product is, again, number of contacts. This is the rate of the contact. So this is how um, the fraction of infected people increases with time. But at the same time, some of the infected people recover. And they recover on their own. The recovery process does not depend on the contact. And so that's why it sort of it decreases here, right? So it's, it's minus. So as a function of time, I, the fraction of infected people, it increases due to the contact and decreases due to the recovery process. Right? So now you have those two competing uh, processes happening. You know, one is infection spreads due to the contact, and then infection decreases due to the just simple recovery process. And then you can actually also write the differential equation. Um, it, it looks like this, and uh, you can try to solve it. In fact, you solve it. You also get a solution. Solution is actually a little bit more complicated. It looks like that. Now. 
one thing to notice about this solution is the following. We have two parameters now, this beta and gamma. Now, beta is uh, infection rate and gamma is recovery rate. Okay? And the behavior of the system really depends on their, on, on, on their relative values. Because, look, if beta, if beta much bigger than gamma, then this difference is negative and time goes to infinity, this becomes zero, right? And other way around, if gamma is greater than beta, then this thing is positive, time goes to infinity, this becomes very large, then this whole thing goes to zero, right? So these are two different limiting behaviors depending on the, ra on, on the ratio of beta and gamma, beta and gamma. And so what happens if beta is greater than gamma, so if infection progresses more intensely than the recovery process, then eventually pretty much the entire, well, not the entire, but majority of the population will be infected at any moment of time. And this actually says the majority of this one minus gamma, gamma will beta, right? So beta much, much larger than gamma, then all of the people will be there. If not, well, it will be the fraction. But the point is, there will be different people who get sick and recover, right? But the ratio will remain pretty much the same. It just says, look, you know, 70% of students in the class um, are sick, right, during the second semester. It doesn't mean it's the same people who are sick, right? Some of them will recover, others will get sick, but it's like 70%. And that's what it says. It says that if the rate of, of, of uh, you know, getting sick, the rate of transmission of infection is greater than the recovery rate, there will be this percentile, percentile of, of people who are, who are sick, right? So infection doesn't go away, it just stays there. Right? It just moves from one, from one person to another, so it's different groups, but as a ratio within the class, you know, there's always 70% sick. Okay? Make sense? And then if there is an opposite limit, which is beta less than gamma, uh, which really means that the recovery happens per unit time much, fast, much faster than the infection, then very quickly, everybody will recover and infection will go away. So what, the way to understand this is if you think about it this following way. Um, recovery rate, for example, think about it this way. Um, let's say every day five people recover from, from, from the disease, right? And beta is how many new people get sick every day. So if every day you have you know, five people recover and one person gets sick, then what happens? After a while, everybody will recover. But if we have five people who recover every day, but 10 people who get sick every day, right? The, the speed with which people get sick is, is, is higher, right? And, and so you will get more and more people sick. But what's interesting is eventually you will, not, you will never get to the situation that everybody is sick because still some people are recovering. And so you will get the situation when if it's like five to, you know, say 10 to five, which is, uh, fraction two, you will have the situation where 50% of the class is sick all the time. And so that's the result of this model. Again, there is the assumption, of course, in this model is that um, everybody contacts with everybody. And, you know, in some sense, if you think about my simple example of the classroom, that is sort of true, right? Because when you come to the classroom, right, you're in the same room, so you, you literally in sort of contact each person with each person. And if there is one sick person, well, that, that that's going to propagate. Okay, so that is SIS model. Now, one last model I want to look at is what's called SIR model. Now, this model is probably, well, out of those, the model we have discussed so far, this is the most complex model. So there are three possible uh, situations here. So you have people who are susceptible then they can become infected, and then they become, you know, depending on the literature, they either 
uh, you know, removed, it's called R removed, and that really means they either recovered, right, or they're dead. So recovered and they got sort of immune to the disease and they will never get this infection again, or maybe, you know, they just died. So that actually changes the dynamics of the system, right? It means, again, think about the disease, uh, you have people who are recovering, you have people who are sick, uh, but those who recover, they kind of, you know, move to the corner of the classroom and they will, they will not be able, they will not, never get infection again, right? And that sort of changes the dynamic of, of the process entirely. It's actually quite interesting that just sort of a very, very simple model, if you look at the dynamics, uh, you know, the dynamics can be pretty, pretty interesting. So, again, I'm not going to go into the details of how you solve this, but the point is, you know, exactly the same. Look, I'm, let's look at this guy. This says uh, the fraction, how changes, how for the fraction of infected people changes with time, and it's increasing, increasing with proportionate to the number of infected people and number of susceptible people, and decreasing due to the recovery, due to people recovering. But what's new here is before we had infected and susceptible people, now we have recovered people, and the number of recovered people increases uh, you know, when people recover, right? So it's just three compartments now. Susceptible, those who never were sick, infected, who got infected, and then recovered or removed those who were sick and then recovered. In the previous model, we didn't have that R. The, the, the people who recovered would become again susceptible. Here we don't have it, right? So this SIR. So it's sort of back there, SIS is sort of a loopy model, right? So kind of people can be reused in some sense by the disease. Here it is sort of one way, right? You get from this stage to that stage to that stage. Okay. So what happens here is the following. If you actually try to solve this model, you know, you, you get those equations and uh, you realize that also what's important here, and I, I don't want to you know, go into the details, but what's important is we also have this, you know, ratio of beta to, R, to gamma, right? Uh, and, and again, it's, it, it totally, I think, makes sense that there is a ratio of beta to gamma because the rate with which people get sick versus the, the rate with which they recover. So here are the three pictures, three curves, and uh, each curve is for uh, one of those fractions, um, the infected people, the recovered people, and the susceptible people. So let me explain what's what. First of all, on, on these curves, um, initially, it's, it's a simulation, right? I just you know, took the initial conditions and solved the differential equation. Um, Initially, I said, okay, well, 10% of the people at, at the beginning are infected, right? So it's like 10 people in the class, one person is infected. And then this is a very sort of strong infectious disease. Um, the rate of the, the infection rate divided by recovery rate is, is equal to four. It's just why four? Well, because it's made nice pictures, but um, no good reason. But it says, you know, it's four times faster people get infected than then recover. So, what happens is this. A red line is the population that is uh, infected. And so, what you, what, notice what happens. Because the infection rate is much higher than the recovery rate, as time goes by, the number of infected people increases, increases, increases. But then what happens? They're pretty much running out of people they can infect simply because those who actually recover, they either, you know, die or they get immune to the disease, right? And so the number of people that potentially infected people can infect start decreasing. You're just running, running out of them. And so the number of infected people decreases with time and disappears. If you think about or read the books about like the way, you know, the plug went through you know, cities, right? It started uh, with a small number of people, then the number of infected people skyrocketed, right? But then, you know, people start dying and, and uh, you know, the number of infected people decreases with time until everybody's dead, right? And so, and that's sort of this progression. Now, if you look at um, 
those two, two other curves, this, uh, the, the, the green curve is the number of susceptible people. It's just those who are, you know, never were sick and they could get sick, it just drops. And this is number of recovered people, those who, you know, were sick and lived through the, you know, through, through, through the sickness, right? Or, you mean, I mean, died or, or, or uh, got immune. So, that's epidemics, right? When pretty much what you have is that, you know, starting from a few people infected, the number of infected people skyrockets, right? And pretty much everybody goes through the, through the phase, through, through the sickness, through the disease. What's interesting within this model is what's gonna happen if this ratio beta to gamma is different. And if this ratio, I, I put it here 0.5, uh, which is the people recover twice as fast as they get sick. Then notice, this is the number of infected people. So here, we're starting with the same ratio, with, with the same, you know, we're starting at the same point, we're starting right here, right? Okay, so it's the same point. But here, number of infected people grew very fast, right, and then start dropping down because there was nobody else to infect. Here, it's just slowly decreasing. So you got a bunch of people infected, and then they recover. Some people will get sick. These are people who, you know, removed or, or recovered. Some of them get sick, but it's also a small fraction. And the susceptible, which is that, that could get sick, it drops, of course, with time, but then levels out, which means there is a big part of the population who never get a disease. Right? So these people who never got any disease, these people who you know, died during, before the disease, and if you compare these two pictures, you realize that here in this situation, pretty much everybody in the population got the disease except maybe you know, a few and pretty much, yeah, all dead, right? Or all removed. Here, it's only a small fraction. And so these are two completely different behaviors. And you can easily, of course, notice the red line, right? Because there's a red line which one in here it just decreases. Here it has a spike, right? And <clears throat> I guess the most interesting part is that those two drastically different behaviors, you can just get them from this very, very simple differential model depending on the parameters, right? And so that's why those models became sort of so famous and, you know, people use them to describe uh, the, the, the possible spread of diseases, right? And so it really, um, the reason, I mean, the reason again this model I used, it's not just because, um, you know, you can, you can calculate those things, but because these are the parameters, right, that in some sense you can control, right? So the recovery rate you can probably control by medication, right? Beta, the infection rate, you can also either control by medication or you can, for example, reduce the number of susceptible people by doing some type of immunization, right? Or by, you know, making sure that the contacts, the people do not contact each other, and that reduces beta. So there is, some, there is some sort of ways you can control those parameters, and so you can actually model the outcome, right? You can, you can try to figure out how, many, you know, how much you have to restrict interaction between people such that beta drops such a way that you're not, get, you're not gonna get um, this spike, you're not gonna get epidemics, but disease just dies out, right? And so what you need to do is you need to make sure the ratio beta to gamma gets below one, right? Again, remember, uh, beta is how many people get infected in a unit of time, let's say, you know, during the day, and gamma, how many people get recovered. And obviously, for, for, for epidemics not to exist, number of infected people per unit time should be less than the number of recovered, right? Um, and you can actually, you know, I'm just, hey, I just hand waved this explanation, but there is a you know, mathematical, um, you, pretty much you can take the equation, you can derive that constraint, and we'll try to do it right now quickly. Um, the idea is the following. So this is the equation that describes um, the, the changes in this recovered population, the blue line, dr, dt. Um, there's this gamma parameter, and uh, 
pretty much all the parameters, beta over gamma and r and r and r here. It's a differential equation. r is a function of time. So if you look um, at these pictures, you realize this, again, r is this blue curve. It's a blue curve, right? The recovered people or removed people. If you look far to the right, when time goes to infinity, this is a flat curve. And so because of that, the derivative when time goes to infinity is zero. Because it's just getting flat, it's saturated. Nothing changes anymore. So if it is zero, I can take this equation, and when time is, goes to infinity, I can actually say that this thing is zero, and I can just look at this equation. Right? So this 1 minus r minus this is equal to 0. And that's what I have here, where r now is the number of recovered people at when time equal to infinity. So there are some initial conditions, which is uh, I'm thinking that at time equal to 0, we don't have anybody recovered because nobody you know, went through the disease yet. So at r equal to 0, the line starts here at 0. Um, initial I0 is, has some value. Uh, this is this value, right? And, you know, green is almost equal to 1. It's all the number of susceptible people. And so that's our equation. Now, this is not differential equation anymore, right? This is just an equation for the number of recovered people at time equal to infinity. So this is just a number. It's a variable. It's a number. Now let's try, I mean, let's try to remember. Um, we have seen very, very, very similar equation to this before. Can you remember when? And that was in the previous module. There was this equation in there. I mean, it was different with different um, letters, right? And came from a very, very different story, but exactly the same type of equation. I can even give you a hint going on to the next slide. There were similar pictures there. Do you remember uh, we talked, when we talked about models uh, for networks. There was this erdos rini random graph model. Remember? So something random graph, right? And when we talked about that model, we talked about what's called phase transition, where uh, below a certain threshold, the graphs were disconnected, right? And then when you cross a threshold, those pieces became connected and it formed like gigantic connected component, right? It's sort of phase transition. It's again, I probably, even back then I was talking about the, the fact that yes, um, it's very much the same as um, you know, freezing of water, right? So we have water, there is a parameter changes, then it reaches the temperature as the parameter reaches zero degrees, and then water from being liquid becomes solid, right? So water freezing ice. So <clears throat> this is the same situation. Uh, what I'm trying to say is the following. If you look at this equation, if I look at this equation, um, there is one obvious solution for this equation. This r infinity equal to zero will be a solution of this equation because if it is equal to zero, this thing is equal to one, this is equal to zero, one is equal to one, just fine. But there might be this, this equation might have non-zero solution. And that non-zero solution we can actually find. And, um, you know, if you look, we can rewrite this equation in the following way. And left-hand side just, it's a straight line. Right-hand side, it's this type of a curve. And so the non-zero solution for this equation happens when this curve crosses this line, right? When the curve crosses the line, that's your solution. If it is right here, it's a zero solution. If it is somewhere there, like here, it's non-zero solution. In order for that to happen, the curve should just, at the origin, should be above this line, right? If it is above this line, 
then eventually it will cross it. And so the condition for this curve to be above the horizontal line here, I'm sorry, not the horizontal diagonal line, is that the derivative at this point of this curve is higher than this one, right? And the derivative for the diagonal curve, what is it equal to? It's diagonal, it's one, right? So we need to differentiate our equation and make sure the derivative is greater than one. And so this one is a critical point. And pretty much what this whole sort of <coughs> all equations telling you is that the critical is when beta over gamma is equal to one. So, and we kind of understand it intuitively. So the ratio of the intensity of the people getting sick over intensity of the people getting recovered, when it is equal to one, that's your critical point. If beta divided by gamma less than one, you do not get epidemics and your, you know, the, the number of infected people just decreases. If beta over gamma greater than one, you get the spike in number of infected people, so it's called epidemics, right? And pretty much everybody within the group, within the you know, society or whatever we're talking about uh, get infected. Make some sense? Okay, uh, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time actually dwelling on the equations. Um, the slides are available, so if you're interested, you can actually look through the derivation. But the point is, again, very simple. There is a fundamental difference in between those two behaviors, um, and you know, the, the only thing that differentiate those two pictures, distinguish those two pictures, is this ratio beta to gamma, right? And when this ratio is greater than, than one, when beta is greater than gamma, you get this kind of spiky behavior, and when beta is less than gamma, things just dies out, right? And again, intuitively, it's very easy when the rate of, inf of infecting is increasing the rate of recovery, you know, when per day more people get infected than recovered, you get epidemics. When less people get infected than recovered, you know, you get recovery of the entire population, right? Make sense? All right, good. Now, that was done, by the way, and, and it's called basic reproduction number, this ratio. And so there is this epidemic threshold, as I mentioned, when this ratio is equal to one, right? Uh, it's a threshold. When beta is greater than the gamma, you got epidemics, and which means at time equal to infinity, you know, pretty much either entire population or almost entire population will be wiped out um, because they will have disease, and when beta is less than gamma, there is no epidemics, and uh, um, you know, things, things happening well, like things going well. So that was 1927, all right? So that model is, you know, almost 100 years old. And um, obviously, um, you know, for right now, we kind of realize that life is much more complicated than that, right? There are many more processes. And um, we can, for example, use um, the network, use networks to come up with the models that are uh, more realistic, right? And one thing which you can, we can possibly change within this modeling frameworks is that um, we can think of people interacting um, not so it's not a fully mixing model, so it's not everyone interacts with everybody, not everybody with everybody, but it's just some people interact with just subset of people, right? Based on their social contacts. So that's the idea. So we want to take that type of model we discussed and put it on top of the social structure where, you know, the only possibility for infection would be uh, you know, if you're interacting with the people you know, which is, you know, your social network. You can also think about these models as describing not only uh, infection, right, but also you can think about this model as describing rumor propagation. Because 
you know, if you think about this, how rumors spread, right? Somebody comes to you, tells you something, well, you know it. You didn't want to know it, whatever. You already know it, right? So you got it. Then you can actually go to somebody else, right, and actually mention this in discussion, and then that person knows it, and so on and so forth. So it has very, very similar style of propagation, right, as the infectious disease. Now, you can, of course, play, you know, different, put in different models saying, like, okay, fine, you know. Um, with rumor, you, I don't know if you recover or not or whatever, right? You know, you heard it and you forgot it, right? Or you heard it, it's a new rumor, so you can actually tell it to two, three friends and you're kind of tired of doing it and you stop telling it or, uh, you know, in two weeks nobody cares about this anymore. Um, but the, the, the idea is there, right? So it is your interaction and it is the fact that there is a person who knows this information, there is a recipient. Recipient might not even ask about it, but he's just told, right? And so it's the same way as somebody sneezed on you and you know, you got your, you got your infection. So, um, those, so these models, um, so what, what happened is, of course, first, um, there was an attempt to use those type of models just to explain, you know, infectious disease uh, propagation then people start using it to describe rumors, then also um, news, and et cetera, et cetera. So pretty much all kind of propagation on the network. Now, to do this, the models were also slightly changed. So you start with a network of contacts, which is a JSONC matrix, and then uh, we change slightly the modeling. Now, we're going to be talking about particular nodes in the model, right? Not the compartment, not the fraction of the entire population, because now we want it to be much more sort of individual. And so we're going to talk about nodes. So there is an index i, which is S i of t. It's going to be a probability that a particular node is susceptible to infection. And x i of t is a probability that node is infected, and uh, r i of t, the probability that node is recovered. So it's the same kind of you know, the same story, the same approach in terms of, you know, three classes of states, but now it is every node has a particular, particular uh, you know, can be a particular state. Now, since these are probabilities, the, they have to add up to one because a node either susceptible or infected or recovered. We again keep the same notation uh, infection rates. So it is a probability to get infected on a contact. But the difference here is you can get infected only through your neighbor, right? In the previous models, in this classical models, you can get infected from you know, anybody in the population. Here you can only get infected through your neighbor. And then there is a recovery rate, which is pretty much the same. It doesn't depend on your neighbor. You just recover with time. And so we go a little bit from this deterministic to probabilistic description, so we're going to talk about probabilities. And we think about the networks where all nodes are reachable from each other, right? Because if the network is disconnected, there is, you know, the, the, the infection will never jump through, through this. And we think about this as undirected network, um, you know, just for conveniences, right? So it means um, infection can go on the contact in any direction. There is no preferred direction. Okay. So there are two processes that might be happening. One process is here's your node, and these are three neighbors, and they are infected. So this node can get infected either from this guy, or maybe from this guy, or maybe from that guy, right? during a particular moment of time. Or it maybe get infected from like two of those, or like all three of them, you know, I don't know, sneeze on the guy and he'll get infected. So you can actually calculate the probability of infection of this node if it is susceptible in the following way. It's a probability, it's actually very similar to what we described. Um, so it's probability of infection during the time delta t. This is the probability that the node is not infected. It should be not infected to get infected. Times the sum of the probabilities that our neighbors are infected. Right? So again, 
Infection can come from here or from here or from here. That's why you're summing it up. And there should be two things happening, right? Actually, three things happening at the same time. This node should be uninfected. The neighbor should be infected. And the infection should cross this edge. So the probability that infection crosses this edge is beta. S is a probability that the node is not infected. X is a probability that its neighbor is infected. And the sum is over all the states of its neighbors. Make sense? Formula. Okay, that's infection. Recovery, this node recovers. Uh, you know, when, when the recovery has happened, he doesn't care about its neighbors. So it just recovers. Um, and the probability of recovery is the probability that the node is infected times the, the recovery rate. So that's, that's pretty much it. So um, nothing fancy here. OK. So now we're going to write, we're going to pretty much follow through the same steps as before, as in the previous models, but we'll just adjust it to the network and to this setup. So we, first we start with this SI model from susceptible to infected. Now, here, there is, notice there is always index i because that means you know, we're, referred, we're referring to a particular node, right? It's not just um, a fraction, it's just a particular node, right? So for any particular node, for any particular node, the probability of the node to be susceptible or infected has to be equal to 1, well, simply because a node is either susceptible or infected, right? Now, there's an infection rate, probability to get infected in a unit of time. So it is a probability that the node is infected. And then we're going to see what happens you know, after, say, a minute or an hour or a day. So that's the state of the node at the beginning of this time interval. Then the probability that it's got infected during that, that time interval is the following. This is the probability of that infection spreads across the edge. This is the probability that node is susceptible to infection. This is adjacency matrix that tells you the connect, connection of this node to the neighbors. And this is the probability of the neighbors of being infected. So it's exactly the same story as we just described in the previous slide. I just put the things together. And so the probability that the node is infected at time t plus delta t, it's the probability of the node to be infected at time t, plus the probability that during this time delta t, uh, infection gets to it. Right? So that, that looks very much, this equation looks very, very much like the one we started this lecture with, except for this summation and this adjacency matrix. So then we're going to get this, and which is actually not a one equation, but it is a set of differential equations. Because remember, for, um, on, on a, on a <clears throat> when we started our original model, we talked about just the fraction of the population. And there was like one equation that describes infections and one that recovered and one that's susceptible. Here, there is index i, which means if there are 100 nodes in the graph, there's this 100 of these equations, right? So it is a system of differential equations. But, that, but you know, it is exactly the same in structure. This tells you the changes in uh, infection right, probability of, of node being infected. And this tells us that infection goes from its neighbors to the node with this rate. Okay? So the difference is there is this matrix. And that's a major difference. Now, uh, so this is a part two of, of your knowledge on differential equations. You probably had you know, differential equations and probably partial differential equations, system of differential equations. So this is a system of differential equations. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through details how we solve it. Again, if you're interested, you know, remind yourself how differential equations work and then take a look. But the point is the following. Uh, the way we usually solve this, if you have a system differential equations, or one of the ways of solving it, is you take the matrix and you find eigenvalues and eigenvalues, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. And then you look for the solution in the basis of those eigenvectors. 
Do you remember anything like that? Vaguely, probably. Sort of. If you have, have you guys ever solved system of differential equations? There are probably some problems on, on uh, I don't know, on, uh, hmm, where would you see this? Uh, somewhere in math, I guess, in differential equations, course of differential equations. So the point is, uh, what you try to do is you try to find the solution as a linear combination of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix that describes this, the, the system. Uh, I will stop at that depth, right? And if you try to do this, literally, and uh, you know, the, the way you do it is, you, again, you write your solution as a combination of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And eigenvalues go here in exponent. You can check that if you take this and plug it in into the equation, you'll get this time dependency, particularly that way. Now, the thing I want to emphasize here. Remember <clears throat> when we looked in, in, in the, let me just actually come back to this SI model right here. So that was the equation, and that was the solution. And this is the time-dependent factor, right? Remember this beta, which is intensity of the interaction and time. Okay. Now, jumping to here, there is beta, there is time, but there is something else in here. And the something else is an eigenvalue of the matrix. And so what you can show is, of course, you know, if this is time evolution, <clears throat> then the, the, import, the most important eigenvalue is the maximum eigenvalue, which is the largest one, right? And so the way the equation evolves is based on the largest eigenvalue. So, which really means that the growth of infection within the network depends not only on beta now, but on the product of beta and the first eigenvalue of the equation, of, of the matrix. Now, why is this important? Why do I keep pushing on this? Well, the reason is because when you have a matrix, right? Remember, graph is represented by matrix. So graph represented, your network is represented by the adjacency matrix. So the adjacency matrix contains all the information about the graph, right? So pretty much everything that is, we know about the graph, it's in the adjacency matrix. What's interesting, if you take matrix and decompose it into eigenvalues, eigenvectors, then you can, you can actually recover the matrix completely from them. So eigenvalues and eigenvectors, they also contain complete information about the matrix. So those lambda, they do encode information about the matrix or information about your graph. And so they somehow encode connectivity of the graph. And different graphs will have very different lambdas. And so that tells us that within this model, the rate with which infection spreads on the network really depends on the structure of the network and not only on the uh, intensity of the interaction. It depends on the product of those two. Now, the way to understand this is also, I think, quite intuitive. Think about the graph, for example, that has like, you know, for example, there is a connection, you know, a lot of connected nodes here, a lot of connected nodes here, and then there is, a, you know, one sort of bridge, like couple edges that connects them. Clearly, that will be a bottleneck for infection propagation, right? So infection will be a very hard time to cross this bridge. So you have people in this room, you have people you know, in the other classroom, and there is only one person that goes once in a while here or there. He will be the only guy who can actually spread the infection. So structure plays absolutely critical role in the propagation of infection on the networks, and this lambda actually encodes that, all right? Okay, so... Remember those curves again. I'll, I'll, I'll jump back. So this curve, we started with this logistic growth function. 
uh, where infection started from zero and then eventually covered everybody, right? So the same type of curves we get here. These are those curves. The difference for each curve, we have different lambdas. Uh, we, have different, we have different lambdas, different graphs. So that's what, that was different. OK. Now, um, since we're dealing with, with a network, um, we can also actually make, make a simulation. And uh, so I want to go over the simulation. Actually, I think it's, it's, it's very telling. So every node at particular time can be in one state, susceptible and affected. So initially, we initialize some number of nodes to be infected. And then what we do, we literally just simulate the process. So on each time step, every node has a probability to infect its nearest neighbor, so the node it's connected to, right? And we can actually see this dynamics, how it changes with time. So here I have the probability of infection of the neighbor is 0.5. And those two nodes are infected, and this is our graph. This is a connectivity pattern. So we, and I can just go into rate step by step, right? So right now, there is a probability 0.5 that its neighbors get infected. So there is a chance for this guy to get infected because it's connected. And there is a chance, I guess, for this guy to get infected. Let's see what's happening on the next step. And this is just simulation. I literally just, what, what I just described, I actually ran that simulation. Uh, oh, yeah. So I, I did notice, but yes, this guy is connected to this one. And there is also an edge going to here, right? OK, boom. Next, so this after one iteration, this guy's got connected, this got connected, uh, this got infected, this got infected, this got infected. Again, remember this is a random process, so probability of infection every step is 50%. And I just you know, selected that beta to be 50%. This one could have gotten infected, but didn't get infected. But this guy, this guy, and that guy got infected. All right? Well, whatever happened, happened. So we just keep, keep sort of stepping through time and just running this simulation. And you know, this guy now got infected at the bottom. This guy infected those guys. Um, notice that infection kind of a little bit. So the fact that those two guys got infected you know, didn't allow infection to propagate anywhere further, right? So because of the structure. So in some sense, it's this guy who kind of became a very infectious problem, right? And so that actually tells you instantly that within the graph, of course, the people who has highest degree centrality are the most dangerous, right, in terms of infection. They can easily uh, infect lots and lots of people. So if you think about immunization strategy, when you have a network world, who do you immunize or remove from the, from, from the group? Those people who has most friends, right? So you have to... So if you want to, if you have a finite number of vaccine, you need to get those people who are the most communicative, right? Those that are um, the, the most well connected and immunize them. That's sort of obvious, but you know, it's nice to see here. And then you just keep going and going and going and going and eventually everybody's infected, right? As we expected. But it's actually nice to see how it just sort of spread it, right? Boom, started and then. All right, now, and actually here, what I had done, I literally just counted the number of infected people, uh, how it grows, and the number of susceptible people, how it decay de decays. Well, it's kind of jaggy, but that's because there is only, what, 30 nodes on the graph, so. But the idea is, yeah, if you infected, then infected grew, and then it kind of saturated. So the same S-curve as we saw before, but it is just sort of literally calculated on the simulations. All right, next model is this SIS model. Um, and what I, what I think we're going to do, guys, we're going to run a little longer um, on this lecture, but then we'll be done. So I don't want to have a you know, second part. So we'll have it. Um, SIS model, susceptible. Infected, susceptible, right? So this is a model with recovery mode. And after somebody is recovered, he gets back into the pool of possible, of people who can get infected. So the same story as before, 
probability of node um, as the, it's susceptible infected. Now we have infection rate and recovery rate. As before, right, there is a sort of two rates that will compete. And the equations here, it tells us that the, intent, uh, the probability of node I to get infected, um, the, or the, the, the change of the infection within unit time, within the time of the node I, comes from two things. One is if the node was not, probability that it was not infected times the rate of infection times the sum of all its infected neighbors, probability of infected neighbors. So this is the infection coming to the node from its neighbors. And this is the process of node recovering from infection. Right? So now there is two competing processes. One is the node can get infected. Second, node gets recovered from infection. And that's what sort of changes the probability of node infection. Uh, again, you know, going through differential equations, blah, 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 blah. Um, look for some time of approximation, look for the solution in terms of eigenvalues, eigenvectors. And here, again, I want you to look right here. Let me jump back into, uh, then I'll stop jumping back, but still want to show this. Right here, we had a solution and two possible behaviors, and there was beta minus gamma that was controlling it, right? Beta greater than gamma, beta less than gamma. That was the controlling parameter. Now, when we get to this story, there is beta times lambda minus gamma. So we again get this eigenvalue thing. And that changes the behavior. Now, all of a sudden, it's not the, the ratio of beta to gamma. It's the ratio of beta times lambda and gamma. So if beta times lambda, great, lambda 1 greater than gamma, then you will get a growth of infection. If beta times lambda 1 less than gamma, you got the decay of infection. And you can actually see it from those formulas. Um, again, you guys probably can you know, do it at home um, if you're interested. Look closely at these formulas, but they actually tell you this, that when time goes to zero, um, that is the behavior that uh, controls the, the spread of infection. Again, lambda 1, which is the first eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue. Beta is uh, grow, uh, the rate of the infection propagation. Gamma is the rate of recovery. And so now it's not beta versus gamma. gamma. It is beta times lambda versus gamma. So lambda has the structure of the graph encoded in it. All right? So um, now with the epidemic threshold, as I said, before it was beta over gamma, but now and we, we, we look at the beta over gamma and we compared it to 1, right? If beta is greater than gamma or beta less than gamma. Now it's not just beta over gamma. It is, I'm sorry, it's not 1. It's 1 over lambda 1. 1 over lam, lambda 1, where lambda 1 is an eigenvalue. So it's again, it comes from this fact, right? If you look at this beta divided by gamma, is greater over 1 over lambda 1, or beta divided by gamma is less than 1 over lambda 1. So it is lambda 1 that is now important. So we can simulate this. How we can simulate it? Um, every node at any time step, again, in one of the states, S or I, we initialize nodes with some, put them in some initial state. Some of them are infected. Each node stays infected one divided by gamma time steps, right? So there is few time steps as long as uh, he stays infected. And that number of time steps a node gets infected is inversely proportional to the gamma, the rate of recovery, right? If I'm saying it recovers, um, you know, it takes two days in, in recovery, uh, well, then, you know, that's how, I mean, if, if it recovers, for example, you know, in, in, in half days, in half day, then, I'm sorry, if rate of recovery is, is half day, then it's going to recover in one divided by half, which is two days. Um, on each time step, time step, node has a probability to infect its nearest neighbor. And after several time step, steps, node recovers. 
So there are two processes now. Getting sick, getting infected from its neighbor, and then recover. And let's see how it, it evolves. So first thing is, uh, those are two parameters, right? Um, so beta is infection rate, so there's a probability to get your neighbor infected 0.5, the same in the previous uh, simulation. And tau is equal to two, it, the node recovers in two iterations. So it gets sick, then two iterations say six, then it's recovered, right? And can it get again sick, get sick. So the same two nodes are infected. Uh, again, this is a random process, so now that's what that, these are the nodes that got infected. Then uh, notice the original nodes got recovered that were infected, right? But some other nodes got infected, right? And then it happens and happens and happens and happens. And so if you notice, we never get the entire graph to be red, right? It's different nodes that are sick at different moments of times but never the entire graph. And so there is a certain fraction of the, of the nodes that are sick after a while, right? So we started with just these two nodes, and then it kind of spread it, but then there's a certain fraction of nodes that are sick, but not the entire graph, right? And it's different people who get sick at the different stages. Right? And so if I draw this picture, and actually I try to calculate this as a fraction as a function of time, well, it's, you know, here it oscillates, but again, because the size is very small, or the simulations, but what it says is, you know, the number of infected nodes increases, 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 grows to the fraction, whatever it is, whatever the fraction is, I can see it here, but, and then it just sort of stays around it, saturated, right? So that's, a, that's what the process happened. Now, but there might be a different situation. Notice what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna run the same simulation, but I put beta, the infection rate, I'll reduce it. So it's going to be 0.2. So which means, uh, you know, previously it was 50% chance that the neighbor got infected. Here it's 20% chance that a neighbor of infected node gets infected. And so since tau is equal to 2, which means after two steps a node recovers, it really means that the node has you know, two chances to infect its neighbor, right? You know, the first time step, the second time step, and then the node recovers. And so in the first time step, the chance is to infect neighbor 20%, and the next time step is 20%, all right? So that's the process. Um, so let's, let's, let's watch what happens. We start with the two infected nodes, then this guy gets infected, then that gets infected, then those, and then infection dies, right? I'll go back. Oops. If you infect it, an infection dies. So the difference was, compared to previous simulation, the difference was in this parameter, right? I changed that. And so depending, remember, if previously on the previous, uh, when, when we talked about compartmental model, it's a ratio of this parameter to this parameter that was important. Uh, here it is this, this, and I get value of this, of the matrix of this graph. That's important, right? And that completely changes the behavior. And if you notice what happened here, yeah, there was some infection, and then it just dies out. So the very, very different uh, scenarios, right? In one scenario, you have this infection that just stays and stays and stays. In another scenario, it just dies out. And the difference is, again, in... in uh, um, the ratio of beta versus gamma, and gamma here, it's this parameter tau. Okay, almost done, right, as you can guess. There is one more model left, which is this SIR model. So let's see how that behaves, uh, sort of how things evolve there. Um, um, we looked at three compartments now, right? It is S, I, and R. Uh, again, node can be susceptible, then it gets infected, then it gets recovered or removed, so it cannot get infected anymore. Um, again, the same sort of notations, S, X, and I. Index I says uh, that it is on a, on a particular node. There is infection rate, there is recovery rate, um, there are equations, 
um, you know, the infection equation stays the same, which is the probability of the node to get in, uh, the, the, the change of the probability of the node infection comes from one hand being infected from the neighbor, on the other hand being recovered, uh, be, uh, you know, g g being recovered, but when somebody is recovered, it increases the number or the fraction of recovered nodes, right? So it doesn't go back to susceptible, it goes to this recovered node bunch. So now, the, again, because node can be in three stages, it's three states, the sum of the probability of being infected or, or susceptible or recovered has to be equal to one. And, you know, we can put together differential equation uh, the same way as before we can analyze it. Again, I'm not going to look, not going to go into the details, but the idea is again the same that here is your, um, your matrix and it is differential, system of differential equations and we look for the solution in terms of eigenvalues of the matrix. And when we do it, what you get there in, expo in exponent is this beta, lambda, and gamma, right? So again, I want you to pay attention that here is this lambda one. And so that's the, the, the critical component in here. Um, and so now we're not just looking at the ratio of beta over gamma, but we're also looking at the ratio of beta, gamma, and lambda one. Like say beta times lambda one greater than gamma or less than gamma. Okay? Now why it is so? Again, because gamma is a recovery rate and recovery does not depend on the structure, does not depend on the neighbors, it just recovers on its own. Beta is the rate with which infection spreads and lambda encodes overall the structure, you know, encodes information about the structure of the matrix and how easily infection will spread in that matrix. I, I mean, well, matrix, structure of the matrix, and that means structure of the network. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you, if you actually try to take those differential equations and uh, literally uh, compute them, right? I mean, it's differential equation, you can numerically solve them. You will get the curves very, very similar to the curves we saw uh, you know, in compartmental, compartmental model, but now they're controlled also not only by beta and gamma, but also by this lambda story. So, the fun part, simulations. Every node at any time step, any time step can be in one of the three stages, right? S, I, or R. We can initialize a few nodes initially in the state I. Each node stays infected that night number, that number uh, time steps. And each time step node has a probability to infect nearest neighbor. And then after a few steps, node recovers. And recovers, it means it switches to a different state. And then it cannot be infected. So there is this dynamics. Model dynamics again means you have infected node plus susceptible node you got to infected nodes, right, with some probability. And then you have infected node, it can become recovered nodes. So there is two processes that happens. Okay. So let's see. I had to infect more nodes for this model to actually work. It's the same graph. Uh, from two nodes, it was not very interesting. So I, get, I, I, ha I had to start with this four nodes. Beta 0.5. Tau is equal to two, so again, after two steps, node recovers, right? Um, let's see what happens. So it got, you know, neighbors got infected, so that's where we're starting now. Neighbors got infected, and the green ones that are recovered now, okay? And so what happens in this population, you know, in, in this scenario, literally, we caught a few nodes, and then it's an epidemics, right? The number of infected nodes with time grew, right? There are like a lot of them, and they eventually cover the entire graph. And if there was a, you know, plug, then everybody is dead. Um, or, you know, if it is some, some other disease, well, you know. But what happened is everybody in the population got this disease. Now, um, where did I go? gun. And so if I actually, literally, again, what I can do is I, at, at every moment in time, like right here, I just calculate, I know there is 32 nodes, I calculate 
how many green nodes we have here, one, two, three, four, right, uh, five, right? Five over 32 is a fraction of the green nodes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 over 32 is a fraction of red nodes, and then whatever is left, a fraction of blue nodes, right? I just calculate those numbers on every step, right? Calculate those ratios. And that's what I plot here. At every step, this is a fraction of red nodes. And so you notice that number of red nodes increased, reached maximum, then decreased because there was nobody to infect and then died out. Number of um, susceptible, number of infected node, number of susceptible node. Right? So the, the, the curves are very, 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 very much similar to those we saw in the very original model 1927. The only difference is we are running this simulation on the uh, graph and we're taking into account the fact that those curves will change due to the graph structure. So on different graphs, they will look different. And now I'm going to run it with a different parameter set. I reduce this, the, the intensity of the infection, right? So the make infection a bit weaker, and then see what happens. OK, well, nothing actually happened, right? Notice. Um, bah, 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 bah. The same node, we're starting with the same infected nodes. They, they recovered infected neighbor, you know, another neighbor, another few recovered here and there, and then that's, we're done. Infection is gone. So what happened in this population with this infection rate, we just like a little bit less than the previous story. Um, there's only, you know, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine got sick, right? The rest of the population never seen the disease. And what's interesting, the difference in, in between here is uh, it, I had like 0.5, now it's 0.2, right? So I just changed um, the rate of infection you know, slightly, and there is a dramatically different behavior of the system. In one case, you got the whole population wiped out. In another case, you got just a few nodes infected, right? So. And that's sort of the curves, the way we, you know, we, we, we draw them before. Um, this is the ratio of susceptible people infected. Uh, I mean, this is, the ra this is the number of people who are susceptible, right? It just decreases, but not everybody got infected. This is the number of people that are recovered. These are people who were infected. So very, very similar curves. Um, but the, you know, the, the message is simple. When you look at these infections and whether you you know, run one model, another model, it, it doesn't really matter. What matters is uh, parameters, right? The ratio of the infection rate versus the recovery rate. And if you run them on graphs, what's important is the graph structure. And the graph structure is encoded in this eigenvalues, right? Okay, final couple minutes. Um, you know, as we described, as we discussed, um, the very, obviously the structure plays a critical role, right? And uh, we can make the simulations, for example, the one I just done, we can make them on the different graphs, right? We can make them on a random graph, on a lattice, on a small world, on, on, you know, on scale-free graphs. Like, look at those pictures. We can actually take the model, right, and run them on all those graphs. Let's say we're right now thinking about um, the model that we're thinking about the number of infected nodes, the, the curve that grows and then dies out, right? The red one. If you look at these graphs, which do you think will have a, you know, on which of them infection will spread faster and you will have those peak sooner. More compact? I mean, this, those who are more connected, right? So prob probably like, you know, small world can be. So this probably will be the slowest, right? Uh, this one, well, you know, on one hand, it can spread around fast here, but not, not, very, not very obvious, right? Let's see what actually happened. 
so these are the simulations that um, the, the guys in the paper did. So the first one is a random network. Um, this is this regular grid um, that that and that and that and the, let's see. Let me get back to this so you can actually see. Um, so what this very well connected random network make a very fast and very strong pick, right? Uh, this one has a much lower peak and much slower growth to the peak, right? Uh, for this one, it actually was quite close to this because it's also a lot of local connections and only very few long, long connections. Um, these guys also got really fast and far away uh, distribution and spread of the infection. So pretty much what it says, as you're saying, that when you look at the network, if your network has a small world effect, right, which means it takes only a few steps to reach any other node, then of course infection spreads very, very, very quickly. If your network is organized more on this regular structure, then infection can, will, will spread much, much slower. Now, if you remember from the previous module, from previous quarter, most of the social networks, what structure do they have? Like the one, the social networks that, that occur in, in real life. They are, they have power law distribution, which means you have nodes with very high degree, right? And in terms of infection, these nodes will help to spread infection very easily. And they also, small world networks, right? Six degree of separation that separates, that connects, you know, the world. And so that means that social networks are really, really easy target for infection spread. And so in social networks, in, in spite of the fact that we're not, not everybody talks to everybody in this world, because the way social networks are organized, are structured, infection still spreads very, very, very fast. And um, the only sort of advantage of you know, this type of modeling and understanding the social network is that you know that certain nodes will play much more important role in spread of infection. Because in the original compartmental model, each person plays the same role, right? Here we understand that some nodes are much better connected than others. And if you remove those nodes, and if you remove long-term connections, long-distance connections in a graph, that will dramatically decrease the speed of, of the spread of an infection. And I mean, that's what pretty much people do, right? If there is some city that becomes infectious, what do they do? Well, they isolate the people, right? They kind of not allow them to travel. Because this, like if you think about it, this is like sort of your local neighborhood, right? And this is your flights long, long distance travel. So if you remove that, infection will be local. Uh, the, same idea, uh, the same idea applies to, uh, you know, to, to uh, so, you know, social graphs. Um, with so, uh, you know, again, if you have a, somebody who is a you know, party goer, that person probably knows a lot of people, goes to a lot of places, or like some salesperson who can, contacts a lot of people. These are the people who need to be isolated in the case of, of infection. If you think about social side of the things, right, and spread of news information rumors, well, you know, you have to isolate sort of journalists, right, or people who are very well connected on the social network because they will play the critical role in the fast spread of news, right? So that's pretty much the story of, of, of how, you, how you apply this to, you know, to networks and how you apply it to um, news propagation. Now, to sum up, um, you know, bunch of bunch of work. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, uh, so the, the original paper is 1927. The network science community looked at those models only in 2001, right? I mean, okay, for right now it looks like a long time ago, almost 20 years ago, but. You know, surprisingly, it took probably 10 years since the network science started evolving when people start looking at those uh, disease models, spread of disease on the networks. A bunch of references. 
Um, these are all about spread of infectious disease. There is also like lots of literature about spread of information rumors um, on networks, but we're going to talk about them um, some other time. Any questions? All right, if you want to really understand this, I recommend you to kind of review the differential equations, understand how they, well, remember how they work, then you can get and understand the equations here. But, um, you know, the, the, the message is exactly the same. So it is beta and gamma, right? If you have a, just a compartmental model, it's the ratio of beta to gamma, the rate of recovery versus the rate of infection. And if you have a graph, it's the ratio of beta to gamma versus, not versus one, it's not just if one bigger than the other, it's versus one over lambda, where lambda is the largest eigenvalue, and that eigenvalue encodes uh, graph structure. Okay, all right, and we're done.